Uh, in some ways, I've come from the UK, from Oxford, from a very different place uh, to here. The city of Oxford is possibly the most expensive city in all of Europe to live in. The average house costs 17 times the average wage. And tomorrow night I'll be talking in Oxford about what we can do about housing and how we can make the city better. And the example we'll give is Vienna. That's, you may think you have terrible problems here with housing. We use you as, as our kind of utopia compared to what we have. Um, but in other ways, of course, it is not that dissimilar to come here. Uh, it's quite nice to get out of Britain at the moment. I look at numbers, I measure things. That is what I've been doing for 30 years. Uh, the picture here by Joseph Kelly is a frontispiece of a book called Royal Britannia that my friend Sally Tomlinson and I wrote this year about Brexit. And it's about what the British are learning about themselves from Brexit. One thing hardly any of us realized was that five years ago in 2014, two years before the referendum, a majority of people who voted in the European elections in the United Kingdom voted for political parties that had moved to the right of the EPP. Our Conservative Party had left the EPP and had joined an alliance with Alternative for Deutschland. UKIP, if you know them, are to the right of the Conservative Party and we have a number of smaller parties. And in 2014, exactly 52% of people voted far right in the UK. And none of us batted an eyelid. We didn't even think they were far right. And we sent 40 odd MEPs to Europe and then the referendum and on and on. Where we are now, where I'm happy to talk later uh, we have some hope at the moment. Uh, the text, questions for you to think about. Why is there almost always, or in fact always, deep poverty wherever you have a concentration of people who are rich? But you don't necessarily get poverty where you don't have clusters of rich people. It appears to be rich people who help create poverty. What role do housing markets and policies about housing have to play in all of this? And how important is, is housing in, for instance, wealth inequalities rising? Why do our maps of human society appear to be fractal in nature? And by fractal, if you remember the Mandelbrot set and these weird images, why when we zoom in and in on a city do we appear to see patterns that replicate each other? The question is, what is going on? Uh, and lastly, I'm going to show you maybe a few images about looking over time and some things which are optimistic. So I'll try to end uh, with a little optimism. I started drawing pictures of, in this case, England and Wales and Scotland uh, in the 1980s. This was when we first got high quality printers. Uh, don't worry if you can't understand the diagram at all. I'm just trying to give you an idea of, of change over time. The diagram is a map where everywhere has been stretched so people get an equal amount of space. The cities are made large, the countryside becomes small. And then what we did is draw lines, and the lines are commuter patterns, where a high number of people commute we draw a line, so you can see them all coming into London. And then we colour the lines by the social class of most of the people making that commute. And so you can begin to get an idea of how a city is working. What is it that allows it to function and how are people divided? A far better way than looking at that very early diagram is just to stand in New York in Grand Central Station go there in the morning at about 5.30 and watch who comes off the trains at 5.30, who comes off at 6 a.m., who comes off at 6.30, who comes off at 7. 
Watch the proportion of women drop and the proportion of men rise. Watch the color of people's skin changes. You can simply spend three and a half, four hours on the platform in the middle of New York and you can see how people are stratified. Um, the second image here is just mixing of colors. In this case, by where people were born. And if people were born in Wales, the color is cyan, light blue. Um, if they're born in Scotland, it's purple. And you begin to see the mixtures of colors. The areas which are white are areas where people are not born in England, Wales, or Scotland. And you so say you can begin to see the clustering of people born outside of Britain. A long time ago, 1981. The same kind of thing drawn again on a normal map and on a population cartogram. On the cartogram, which opens up the cities, you can suddenly sp see the spaces where immigrants are allowed, encouraged to come. So it's a different way of looking at how people mix. And we can measure the changes over time between censuses. And in some ways in Britain, people have actually mixed more in terms of where they were born and by immigration status over time. But in other ways, they've mixed less by how much money they have. So we've had increasing social segregation by income. The incomes of the rich have gone up and up. The incomes of the poor have actually now fallen. And people are more likely to live further away from each other while still being tightly wound around each other, particularly in the big cities like London. And to put it very crudely, the kind of thing which is going on is what people with a lot of money desire or appear to spend their money on is the labor of other people. Other people to clean their houses, other people to look after their children, other people to change the beds in the hotels that they use, and all those other people somehow have to be near to where the rich are because the rich need those people. Uh, the rich, in a way, nowadays generate poverty. People often talk about different cities being differently socially divided. And there are a number of ways in which we can measure social divisions in cities, and I'm not going to show you any of this, but I'll tell you what my finding has been over decades of looking at arguments about this city is the most divided in Britain. No, this city is most divided. No, this city is most divided. What you tend to find <coughs> is that within any one country, all the cities tend to be similarly divided. The same kind of gradient is found with tiny differences. Some countries have much less inequality. Finland, Norway, Sweden are the classic examples in Europe, and Denmark to an extent, and to an extent Germany and France, less than average in the Netherlands. And some are more unequal. Uh, the UK is currently the most economically unequal of all 28 U EU member states. And when a country becomes very unequal, all its cities begin to become very unequal. People with money try to move away from people without money harder and harder. They get scared. They're willing to spend a lot of money to move away. Let's go out to the world. This is a, a world map. 7.6 billion people, I think, are heading towards. World population is slowing down, by the way. But this is what the world looks like if you take the oceans out and you give everybody equal space. If you're interested in this artistically or in terms of cartography, what's special about this map is that it's showing you all the lines of latitude and longitude. You may be able to see them, I don't know. I can't tell how good your eyesight is or how the projection's working. But there are vertical lines and there are horizontal lines. And within each square, the square is the size of the number of people living there, which is why China is large and India is large. The lines have all been bent, but they're still all meeting at exactly 90 degrees. So it's a completely correct map. Um, 
you may be able to spot Austria. It's a little purple uh, area just pushing, pushing into the blue of Eastern Europe. Uh, that's where we are in the world, in a rather insignificant continent in the top corner. And if I could show you this bigger and bigger and in higher detail, you can see cities in China. You can see Chongqing. There's often a debate, where does the city start and where does the city end? Well, on these kind of maps, uh, you don't have to worry about that. You have an idea. And if you look at Tokyo up there, I wouldn't need much bigger a screen than this and a more high-resolution projector. And I could actually sh show you streets in Tokyo on the world map. Because 7.6 billion people isn't actually that many. It feels like a lot. Um, but the world isn't actually that big. It is remarkably connected. It isn't necessarily that scary unless somebody scares you about it. But that's, that's the human planet that you're living in. Since 1968, the speed of growth of, of the human population of the world has begun to slow. It's now slowing incredibly rapidly. It's only rising by about 1% a year. In 1968, it was rising by 2.1, 2.2, the fastest it has ever risen in the history of our species. Just 1968. Over half of that growth rate has already gone. We're currently on course for population to become stable some point after 2050, probably before 2100. The first stability of our species ever that hasn't occurred because of war, famine, pestilence, or disease. Uh, there are many reasons to actually be optimistic about where we may be heading towards. There are cities which have stopped growing all over the world. And there are still, of course, some cities which are growing. And we find it all incredibly difficult. And we find it all incredibly difficult because it is so new. And because we were not designed to cope with this. Uh, this slide is showing you a sign above the heads of people sitting on a train in Britain. We didn't used to have these signs in Britain. Uh, but now we have to tell people we want everyone to have a great journey, so please consider others around you. And you can get very depressed. You can kind of despair. You know, are things so bad that we have to put up a sign telling human beings that they should consider other human beings? But that is, remember, in the most unequal country in Europe with the lowest rates of literacy and problem-solving ability and so on. Britain is at the bottom of the pile. And a train going through apartment blocks in China. May not be a good idea, might be a good idea. Things are going differently. And it's easy to feel small. It's very easy to think that this is entirely out of control. You do not matter. And in many ways, of course, none of us do. And we shouldn't expect to matter. I'm constantly amazed when people get angry and say they want to change things. And I think, you're one of 7.6 billion. Just a little change is fair enough. You know, you don't have to do very much. Um, but we have a mentality that's still based on the idea that we're living in a small group of two dozen people. Inequalities and unfairness. This graph is fairly well known in Britain. The Economist magazine produced it. And ironically, rather than talk about what it shows, there was a big debate about whether the graph was wrong or not. Uh, the graph isn't wrong. I come from a very, very unequal country. I can go on and on and on about it, but I, I won't. Other than to try and make you feel a bit happy about where you are. Believe me, it can get much worse. Uh, and there's no need. One thing the UK has done recently is, is provide a brilliant service to the rest of Europe. We've shown what happens if you try to leave the EU. We have demonstrated it. Somebody was probably going to do it. 
I'm quite glad it wasn't Greece because Greece has been through enough already. There is some kind of weird justice in the fact that the richest place on, on the planet a hundred years ago is now the place which is helping demonstrate why borders really matter, why you can't simply cut yourself off from other people anymore. The most unequal cities in the world, and there are lots of different ways of measuring this, but they're found in Africa and in the Americas. One thing which is worth holding on to is that in all of the world, when we begin to measure inequality in different ways, wealth, income, opportunity, social mobility, how many holidays people get, what level of education they achieve, how much the housing costs them, the quality of the housing. The greatest equality on the planet is found in Europe. It's as good as it gets at the moment. The most equal cities in the world are found in Europe. Again, it tends to be Scandinavian. Japan doesn't do badly either. But when you're thinking, this is terrible, why can't we do a better job? It's well worth remembering that the places that have got infant mortality down to two babies per thousand dying, the places that have no homelessness at all, the places with the best educational results for the bottom quarter of children are all to be found in, in Europe. And there's a lack of celebration of this. When it comes to equality and freedom, places that do a good job of it keep quiet and don't say they do a good job. And if you go and say, so I won't say nothing else about housing in Vienna, but if I, if I go to Oslo and say, congratulations, you have the lowest child poverty in the world, the reaction I normally get is, how can you say that? It's terrible. Which is why Oslo has the lowest child poverty in the world, because they care. But I do worry that because we don't talk about those places that have done best, it is easy to get nihilistic and to think that everything's going to be worse. But a little bit about worse. In case you don't believe me, this is the OECD League Table of Inequality. Uh, the figures were from 2015, they're very similar now. There are many OECD countries, I'm only showing you the worst ones. Uh, Mexico has the greatest inequality, but it's actually falling at the moment. Chile has the next greatest inequality, but it is falling. Next is Turkey. And there's an interesting pattern now over who's in charge and issues of freedom and whether I could say this in Turkey or not. But think of who's in charge in Turkey. Next most unequal is the United States. Think of who's in charge in the United States. And these things are circular. It's not just that despots and bigots tend to favor inequality. It's also that countries and states with greater inequality tend to favor despots and bigots. The two countries in the world which had the fastest rise in inequality in the 1930s were Germany and Japan. And the inequality rose first. And then the political behavior and the fear came after. Lithuania, the figures, Lithuania is no longer there because the survey results change because it's small. But Russia, and again, think who's in charge of Russia. And then the United Kingdom. And it took us some time to manage to get a remarkably bigoted, terrible man there just to help create the series, but we've got one now. Uh, and then Israel. So I live and work and my children grow up in a country where the economic gaps between people are wider than they are in Israel. That's Israel including the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And it takes some doing to be more unequal than, than Israel. I've got two or three minutes. I'm going to show you something very different. And if any of you at the end want to tell me which book cover we should go for, um, I'm working on the speed of change next. So I've done lots and lots of maps with many, many colleagues, lots of looking at inequality. 
Uh, but I'm interested in what people are always interested at these talks. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen next, which of course is the one thing you know absolutely nothing about. If you have my job, I can tell you a lot about what's happened. But what I'm going to show you now are just a few from 67 graphs about the speed of change. And the argument, as you can tell from the cover of the book, is that things are slowing down. And this is interesting. Well, at least it is to me. I won't go through that text. You can read the text. It's an attempt to explain how we begin to measure, measure slowdown. To measure whether something is slowing down or not, you need really, really good data because you're measuring the changes between years or between months. If there's any error in the data, then the speed of change will show you the error. So the things that I look at are things that we tend to measure quite well. This is made up. This is, I actually drink far more coffee than this. Um, the graph, the amount of coffee, is how high up is the dot vertically. So if you head towards the top, it's five cups a day. Down at the bottom, it's zero. It moves from side to side. When it's rising, the graph is always above where the <coughs> coffee cup is on that side. And the faster it's moving, the further it is over that way. I won't do left and right because I'm dyslexic, so I can't remember left and right, but your left and right is different from my left and right, and I don't even know my left and right. When it's moving fast, in terms of how much more coffee I'm having, it goes on one side. And when it's decelerating quickly, it goes on the other side. You either get it or you don't. You don't have to because it's late. But that's the attempt to show how these graphs work. And I'll just show you a few. Before then, I forgot about this one. Um, I didn't invent these things. They come from physics. And they're called phase portraits. And this is the phase portrait of a pendulum. So the vertical axis between the numbers 3 and 1 is how far over is the pendulum one way or the other. The horizontal axis is how fast is it moving. And as it begins to slow down, the dot is spiraling into the center. And this is all about ways to try to draw pictures, to see things, to get an idea of what's what's happening, okay? Some real data. Student debt in the United States. I don't know, you can tell me later how much money people pay to go to university here. I don't think you charge your students 9,000 euros a year to go to university, do you? Okay? But people don't count their blessings. There aren't people out celebrating every day in Vienna going, look, we're not charging people 9,000 pounds a year to go to university. Well, in Britain we do, because we copied the United States. And the United States now has an enormous debt mountain, which is currently at 1.6 trillion US dollars is owed by students and former students to the agencies from which they borrowed money to be able to go to university. Now, you can just look at that number and you can say, student debt is terrible. And it's rising, it's going up and up and up, and it is rising and going up and up and up. But what I'm showing you here is that although it rises, here it is, July 20, 2009, slows. Although it's always rising, the slope of the graph has changed. Since 2009, it is moving back towards the axis. It is not rising as fast as it was. It can't, of course. You can't have American students owing the entire planet. But it's an example of something that people often think is still accelerating, slowing down. The only things which are still accelerating that I can measure is the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere, which is doubling every 24 years. It was doubling every 23 years. Still game over if we don't stop it. But carbon pollution is still accelerating. The number of flights people take a year in the world is still accelerating. It's about four billion a year at the moment. Mostly done by very few people like me. And the number of university graduates in the world is still accelerating. 
almost everything else still rising, but has started to slow down. This is what a financial crash looks like. So this is the US housing market. And you can see how it's fastest acceleration. Well, that's actually 2003, but then 2006. And then the prices come down, the mortgages come down, recovers slightly, comes down again and again, recovers and so on. This is, if you like, the anatomy of a, it's like a, a picture of a heart attack to a housing market. But house prices in the US have actually been slowing for some time. They don't double anymore in a few years as they did in the 1970s. But people don't step back and look at that. Currently, London has some of the highest house prices, I think, anywhere in Europe. You have to go all the way to San Francisco to find higher house prices. And that in, currently in London, they've been falling a bit. What people in London don't know is that if you look at the, the city that was the most powerful city in the world before London, which was Amsterdam, when house prices peaked there, they fell in real terms for 250 years. Um, you tell that to people in London, and they say, why are you telling me that? House prices will never fall in London. Things will never change. They will never get better. You can't dream. The most important slowdown of all is us. These two graphs are showing you the world and France. And they're showing you the, the speed at which women are having fewer and fewer babies. And it is absolutely remarkable what's going on. Uh, worldwide, shortly after 1992, the average woman in the world had fewer than three babies each. We're currently at 2.4 babies. And the speed of slowdown has recently accelerated in the last two years. In China, the one-child policy has been relaxed. Turns out people have got used to having one child. Turns out economic slowdown in China means that they're having even fewer children this year than the year before. Um, France has the highest fertility rate in Europe. You get even more money for the third child than you get for the second, and still the French cannot get it back up to two. When we worry about freedom and immigration, there is absolutely no way in which Europe is able to reproduce itself anymore. That has ended. There are cities now, whole countries, Korea's at 0.95 children per woman. Korea is set to halve its population in one generation. Barcelona is one child per person. This is all very good news, but to actually simply maintain some of our cities, we're going to require enormous rates of movement into the cities because of the incredibly rapid drop of people having children. And even when you make the circumstances easier to have children, when you create a housing system where you can actually start a family, women are choosing to go for one rather than two children. And a quarter of people have no children, of which half have chosen to have none, and half found out they cannot have a child. This is the biggest slowdown worldwide. They're going to stop moving now, you'll be glad to know. US public debt, still rising, but slowing down. The NASDAQ is the other um, line being shown there. And you can see the dot-com bubble bursting, and you can see where we currently are with the NASDAQ. There are all kinds of things that you can look to, and things are unstable. I think I'm almost at the end of these graphs now. World GDP per capita is slowing. It's particularly obvious on a log graph. It had to slow. We're not going to get richer and richer. You can't do that. Um, we're settling down into something different. We're settling down to be an urban species. We're settling down to be a population somewhere between 9 and 10 billion. We're settling down to live in small families. 
We're settling down to live in areas where it makes no sense to have cars. And we're settling down to be in a situation where the vast majority of people in the world who have children can expect their children to now outlive them and not have to fear their children dying. These are incredible changes that have occurred in just a century. A hundred years ago in England, one in ten of the children of the upper classes with servants uh, died before their fifth birthday. The world has completely transformed. I lied. This is the last two. You have to believe me about what it shows because it's too complicated to look at. But you do see sudden jumps. Uh, the graph about marriages in England is showing that something dramatic occurred in the 1990s. And from, the, from 1990 to the year 2000, we in England changed from a situation where you were expected to get married to somebody of the opposite sex to you to a situation where you could get married if you really wanted to get married to somebody. And hence the whole thing moves. Tokyo, and this is where the, these graphs were actually first came from, they were produced by Japanese academics. Tokyo had enormous changes since the 1920s. Building in the suburbs out, spreading out enormously, then building tower blocks in the middle, then building out in the suburbs again, then building up in the middle. And then as it spirals into the middle, like the pendulum, Tokyo stopped changing. Population of Tokyo stopped rising. Public transport in Tokyo works. Tokyo is probably going to be, bar an enormous earthquake, although they have designed for an enormous earthquake, Tokyo in 50 years' time might actually be very like Tokyo today. And that, that's part of the hopeful side of things. We get worried and scared and annoyed. And this is my last slide, so I'm gonna, gonna stop now. We get worried and scared and annoyed because things are frightening. Lots of very bad and terrible things happen. But if you need to be optimistic, or it helps to be optimistic sometimes, if you step back, we appear to learn and change a generation at a time. Not a decade, but slowly. So if I just end on the carbon pollution, the nearest equivalent we have to carbon pollution is nuclear war. And if you look at the changing reactions to nuclear war, there were a few people when we first thought of the idea of having a nuclear bomb who said this was terrible and could foresee what was happening, but they made the bombs, they dropped the bombs. And then there were people who protested about the bombs and people said that they were weird and they were hippies and they didn't understand the need for defense and so on. And then we got people modeling the effects of nuclear bombs. And in the 1980s, scientists worked out that the majority of the population would be dead or dying within two weeks. And then they began to dismantle the bomb shelters because there was no point having bomb shelters. And then they began to disarm. And we disarmed 90% of nuclear weapons. Now, we still have nuclear weapons, we still have too many, and we can still have a nuclear war. But the chance is dramatically different. But it took a long time to get to that point. Now, the nice thing about nuclear war is it really concentrates the mind because it could happen at any time. The problem with carbon is that although the relationship between CO2 and temperature is almost perfectly linear, so you know exactly what's going to happen, the next 20 years for us will probably be okay. And in 20 years' time, I might not know what's going on anyway. But if you're not my age, it becomes much more obvious. But generation at a time, dramatically different ways of behaving, dramatically different attitudes, with steps that go backwards at certain points. Uh, look at the difference between the attitude of young people and old people. The only time to get really scared is when the young want something that's nasty. And when the young want something that's nasty and horrible, then you should worry. But if the young want things which are good, then it's just a question of what do we have to do to get through to that point. Thank you very much.
Okay, um, thank you, Danny, for this um, wide introduction into different spatial phenomena and for also already mentioning um, Jena um, and bringing it, bringing it once um, a relationship of the UK and uh, Austria. And this is also one of the parts that I will be taking um, to bring some of your issues um, into relationship of um, issues here. Like one is you said you had 52% um, uh, votes for, for far right in the UK. Well, we know from yesterday that we have 55% voting for, for the right uh, in Austria, so, um, or even more, depending on how we calculate. Uh, and then, of course, people would argue to what extent um, it's uh, to what, what right, um, or how far right, or if it's middle right. Um, so, uh, in this sense, um, what I think could be interesting is uh, we are comparing countries that are quite different in how they kept their welfare state system. We have Austria, which is uh, supposedly much better and especially, and we have to actually really make a distinction between Vienna and Austria, the countryside, um, or not the countryside, but really Vienna is a very specific uh, place within Austria when it comes to voting and the way uh, people um, relate to, let's say, the city relates to the welfare state and um, um, and uh, this brings me to the very first um, uh, question I would want to debate with you. In Vienna, it is quite, I mean, you said, okay, why don't people constantly celebrate that everything is still good, right? Why, why are we not celebrating on the streets that we are living in Vienna, that Vienna is so great, that um, kind of we really have become a model city to the world, literally, for the housing situation that is here. Um, I could give a talk, ah, <laughs> some people I know, I could give a talk about the Viennese um, uh, housing situation every other month uh, in other places because the whole world looks into Vienna. So um, how to speak in a place, um, or in a place, or about a space, um, a place like Vienna, uh, where you say, okay, why don't we celebrate more? However, this difference between poor and rich and exactly the kind of um, spatial uh, dimension or the spatial distribution of richness and, uh, and uh, um, the, the kind of lack of resources is to maybe a different scale, but also happening here. We have 60%, let's say more or less, um, of social uh, people living in social housing, so there's a lot of, a large proportion of, this, of, of the society here well, um, kind of well housed, but we have an ever growing number of people who are actually experiencing the same extreme conditions as in other places, maybe as in London. So um, I can see your point of saying, okay, we need to celebrate what is good, but um, we also need to, and this is something that um, I do think which is very important, if we take such places as Vienna um, as as examples to the world uh, to, to some extent, then maybe it's exactly the, the duty of the place to actually say, why not make it better? Because as you mentioned so nicely, it's exactly because we protest when things get worse that we keep the level. I mean, so I, I wanted to see your position there because you kind of sounded like as if we needed to celebrate more rather than to critique, which um, I would um, challenge. No, no, I'd agree. I suspect that the best people to say that something is, is good or better than elsewhere is somebody from outside. Um, because you notice it. So, if you're trying to understand why do people live longer in Japan than anywhere else in the world? Um, going and looking at the reasons is easier for somebody from outside. What somebody in Japan will tell you is it's still very hard to be old. We don't have enough care staff. We don't let in the Filipinos. Um, so it's, it's easier f from outside, but we tend to talk about what's worse. So I can publish lots of papers about the opioid crisis in America. 
the fact that life expectancy is dropping in America and so on. We don't get anything for every paper about how terrible something is in America. We get very few papers about why it's so much better um, elsewhere. But it may not be the responsibility of the people in the place which has done a better job. It's, my concern is so many people do not know uh, in the more unequal countries of the rich world that if you want a good system of housing, you have to have at least 50% public housing. It doesn't work otherwise. You have to have very close control of what goes on, otherwise the greedy get more and more. Uh, in the US and the UK, one argument from the right is get rid of all laws. Get rid of any planning laws and then the market will... And what the market does is end up with fewer and fewer people owning more and more and more empty houses. Um, and are you not afraid that your beautiful graphs um, that tend to say, okay, things are getting better or are slowing down anyway, are um, kind of opposing the necessary, I would even say, more intense critique um, ah, that I is have, needed? Um, I didn't show you the graphs which are less beautiful, which are the carbon ones. Okay. Because that doesn't just show carbon rising, but the rise is getting bigger and bigger and bigger each year. So it's like an Armageddon graph. Um, I'm most concerned that people give up. I'm worried that people will give up. Okay. They'll just say, we're told that there won't be enough food in the world, that the soil's all being washed away, that we've acidified the oceans, that species extinction is now unstoppable. And it's not that hard. And there are groups of young people who have given up and just sit in their room at home. It's not that hard that hard to, to think there is only going to be dystopia. I remember most of the fiction for the young is dystopic fiction um, about, you know, these are the children's books that sell well now. So being able to say many things seem to be settling down. Um, carbon pollution above all else. You do need to work out how to organize yourself in a country and a city and be more equitable and give everybody not just an equal chance, but spend most on the poorest quarter. We have evidence that you should do that now. But yes, we've still got to win that fight in countries. But aren't you, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to challenge you, aren't yeah. these, I can see that you want to comfort people by saying it's getting slower, or it's yeah. slowing down or it's getting better, but um, to what extent does that, I mean, A, how do you translate it to somebody who's really having is in a bad situation. Yeah. How do you translate it to a woman who is uh, literally like stepping out of the subway at five o'clock in the morning because she commutes two hours mm -hmm. and actually has a double job and cannot, uh, can actually not sustain her living um, throughout yeah. the month? How do you, com I mean, yeah, is that an issue that you translate that? And uh, what would the appeasement or like the easing in these graphs, um, the easing how would they ease or? Um, <laughs> But if we, could, if we could measure the number of people having to get up early in the morning to go to work in the world, we would be able to show that, that that's almost certainly fallen. Uh, it's fallen mainly because most of the population were working on agriculture 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. The tractor was only invented in 1908. Uh, so long days and hard labor and factory labor were common. We concentrate on the awful cases, otherwise nothing will get better. Mm -hmm. But we don't tend to notice the overall improvement. For a woman who's doing two jobs and getting up at five o'clock to go and clean an office so that a man can sit in a clean chair, what I think you can say is that it is entirely possible, if not actually probable, that your daughter and granddaughter will have a much better life than you, if people organize themselves, but it is possible. That, that is where we could be heading. Yeah, it's, and many of the ways in which we construct things are unnecessary. You don't have to run a city like you run New York. You can run a city much more like you run Tokyo, where of course there's still the rich and poor in Tokyo, but it has the smallest gap of any city in the world between rich and poor. The lives of people in Tokyo are more similar to each other than anywhere else. 
which is also why you don't worry about crime in Tokyo, uh, why it's very, very hard to get yourself mugged if you're a foreigner, because it tends not to happen. It's not utopia, but it shows what people should be learning in New York. But there's interesting reasons, which include racism, about why we don't look at places like Tokyo as a model. Well, uh, my interest is uh, radical democracy, and this would maybe be exactly looking into the case of those who are not part of the kind of um, winning track. Yes. Because I think one of the starting points was that there's a kind of distinction or like a, 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 a kind of split between uh, uh, accessibility to resources, uh, between uh, freedom of choice to um, freedom of choice to where you live, freedom of choice um, to um, how you want to live, um, and so on. So my, I really still want to pin it down. Um, are you saying that for the most of the people, you could ease, you want to ease the situation by saying it's slowing down, don't worry, like your house will not, not accelerate so fast, um, in, yeah. or like your rent will not accelerate so fast, or, or where is the political take in that? Um, like when yeah. you... The, the, the political take is, on average, progressives have actually won more than they have lost, but they don't know it. Um, so there's a kind of melancholy, a, a sadness about the left. Uh, the left tends not to celebrate. The right celebrates all the time. Aren't we great? Aren't we brilliant? Uh, there was, in Victorian England, there's actually called a condition where left-wing people would get depressed it's all too hard, and who am I to make it better because I'm not special? Um, the changing power of women over the last 200 years has been unbelievable. And we're not heading for a Blade Runner future. The graphs are heading away from that kind of world of super rich and super poor. Uh, one other example. In the majority of countries in the world, rich and poor, income inequalities are now falling. Not everywhere, but in the majority of countries, the gap between the rich and the poor has fallen over the last five years. And just knowing that, rather than thinking, it's always getting bigger. Now, the wealth gap is getting bigger. The wealth of a few billionaires is still uh, growing, but there's an enormous amount of attention being paid to that. It hasn't come off yet, but the income gap... Um, the average. I think... Yes. Yeah. I the average. Think we have, a, we have an issue with like um, uh, politics of numbers or politics yes. of statistics here, right? Like ev average doesn't speak about um, those cases that are on the extremes. No. Um, but if you were to take Austria and look at the 10% uh, poorest and 10% uh, best off, then Austria does not get into the group of countries where you're worrying about the very big rise. Um, so it's trying, trying to say that, things, that some things have been won and are good. Um, and how do you relate that to um, politics, to achievements of, uh, let's say, to redistribution um, uh, concepts and, and uh, to taxes, to... Uh, yeah. But on taxes, and, th and th this is a tricky thing, um, because you're always saying that another country is doing better. So in, do you know about the 350 million on the bus in the Brexit campaign, have you heard? Boris Johnson promised that if the UK was to leave Brexit, an extra 350 million pounds would be spent every week on the health service. Now currently Germany spends just over a billion euros more a week than the UK on health services. Okay, slightly split health service. But on the bus it should have said a billion a week. Germany does it by higher taxation uh, and by not having nuclear weapons and so on, or a large, or an aircraft carrier. Now the problem is, if I say, look at Germany, this is how you spend an extra billion a week on your health service, People in Germany say, there are lots of problems with our health service. It could be better. And you go, yes, but believe me, if you spent a billion a week less on it, you would have what we have in Britain. Our infant mortality rate has been rising for four years. Babies are more likely to die in Britain now than four years ago. Um, so 
if you cannot say that somewhere else in Europe does a better job, because that place always says, but it's not good enough, then, you, then the people on the right who want to argue we should have a free market health system, bring the Americans over, they can begin to win. And, and I don't know whether I worry too much about this, but maybe one reason that socialism is in a mess across most of Europe, not in the UK, incidentally, but maybe one reason that socialism is, is in a mess and not popular in most of Europe, is it fails to actually talk about what it has achieved, what is achievable and what is better. Because in the places where it's better, the socialists are all saying it's not good enough. And then how do you expect people to vote for people who haven't got some kind of grasp of it's possible? We, we have this situation in Vienna at this moment that um, uh, the city of Vienna and especially the Social Democrats are actually celebrating 100 years of Red Vienna. So this is a, a very specific case of, um, of an example of, um, of celebrating um, a kind of realized concrete utopia of uh, socialist um, uh, politics put into place and built uh, like uh, loads of um, uh, workers' housing, but also uh, infrastructure, um, um, uh, working on, uh, on several levels of um, politics. And, uh, and in fact, it's true that um, the question is to what extent do you actually celebrate that here and, um, and give credit to it, and then again um, acknowledge facts where you uh, acknowledge um, the kind of limitations and slow uh, even like uh, destruct, the slow destruction of it. Yeah? Um, and then we have all these people come in and say, well, if you look into London, and uh, this is exactly uh, into Oxford, uh, this is where you see how bad it can go. Yeah? So be happy that you are in, in Vienna. And um, I do think that to find a way to say, yes, we acknowledge um, or critically inherit um, what is to be inherited, and we don't throw uh, overboard, like we don't throw the baby out of... Uh, with the, with the bathroom um, water. But um, with this critical inheritance, we actually also see and celebrate, if you want, okay, very, very happy to celebrate um, social democratic or socialist um, achievements, yet in a time where after like um, uh, so many years, basically um, neoliberal uh, planning has been able to dismantle, has been able to crack and even trying to, like it's not only trying, but it has done its uh, effects on Vienna. Um, I do think that there's more reason to celebrate on the other side than on, on the socialist side or on the social democratic side. And I, but I can see your point. Maybe this is exactly where it would be interesting to discuss with you to what extent um, and, and open up the floor to the audience, to what extent or where you would see um, yourself or basically how you would see this with regard either to Vienna or uh, generally um, and um, well what do you think of this um, concept that Danny just presented or any questions uh, why is um, and we just experienced the same uh, of course in Austria as anywhere else um, uh, social Democrats um, lost a lot here yeah. as, as, um, as well in the elections yesterday. And of course, this is not a talk about social, democ uh, like social mm. dem Democrats, but uh, the question is really, um, is the left, and what, we, what was happening is actually the Greens won a lot. Yes. So um, you are, uh, now we could test your argument in, in terms of saying uh, that the Greens won so much would actually uh, uh, relate to CO2 still rising. Um, so what would you actually tell rebellion, extinction? Um, um, what's the prognosis of, um, of kind of their um, protest and um, how could they actually use your graphs in, within their protests? Um, I mean, they can, they can use my graphs to, to scare people. Um, because the temperature ones and the CO2 ones are they're, they're the main scare, scary graphs that I've done about what happens. They're, they're the out of control things. Um, and the last 10 years is the 10 years in which it became unequivocal that temperature's rising. So the climate change deniers have largely gone quiet. They're now trying to deny species extinction. 
um, because the spe measuring species is much harder than measuring temperature um, to do that. It's, I'll just give you sort of two, two examples. The New York Times measures far-right voting across Europe every year and produces a graph for every country uh, and showing what the far-right voting was before and the trend. In recent years, in the majority of countries in Europe, the far right's actually fallen rather than risen. But nobody reports the falls uh, at all. But of course it has to, otherwise you know, it can't keep on rising, otherwise it would fill up. It has fallen again in the average um, of where? In the, in the majority of Europe, so think about Greece and Golden Dawn. Mm -hmm. um, but it actually falls in more than it, than it rises. And who is part of this, um, uh, who is labelled right? This um, would be the good question. They, 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 they do it uh, mainly by blocks in the European Parliament. So there are lots of different, different ways. We don't talk about how we achieve things. So we talk about it being pulled apart or dismantled. And this is in, same in my country. So in England, there's a big campaign to restore council housing, to take us back to where we were in the 70s. Uh, to restore comprehensive schooling, take us back to where I got to in the 1970s, and to save the NHS and take it back to where it was in the 70s. What the left isn't doing is what it used to do. And what the left used to do in the 1930s is imagine something and say, can you imagine all the children going to the same school? And then getting it 40 years later. Um, and imagining, and for some reason, in quite a lot of Europe, we've lost the ability to imagine something much better, argue for it and win it. So we end up constantly defending what we had got and it's not attractive. Where the huge momentum is at the moment is students and school children and is carbon. Uh, one of the fortunate things about carbon is that there's a nice relationship between inequality and pollution. So the most unequal country in the OECD, the USA, pollute per head twice as much as the most equal country. People in more equal countries are much more likely to purchase carefully, not to waste money, uh, not to take trips that are necessary, and so on. Uh, even the poor in the USA are consuming and borrowing more money to be able to buy more stuff to keep up with people in the middle. So Extinction Rebellion are catching on to the fact that if you don't have greater equality, the planet burns even faster. Um, now, it's kind of, it's very, very useful, that's the fact. It'd be, the alternative would be awful. And the alternative is argued by people on the right. Uh, it's the Zach Goldsmith argument, the billionaire's argument, that we should have greater and greater inequality because a few rich people can look after all the money. And if the poor have less, then they can't go on holiday, they can't pollute and so on. Now, the, the stats, it turns out, that isn't what happens. Uh, an Extinction Rebellion should look at that. I don't think you should worry so much about left and green, but it's a problem in my country as well. I cannot get um, people who are in the Labour Party and the Green Party to talk about how they will quietly not compete against each other in certain areas. And this is despite the fact that Sebastian Corbyn, Zeb Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn's son, was the paid researcher for Caroline Lucas, the head of the Green Party. So that the son of the head of the Labour Party works for the head of the Green Party. And if you can't get them to work together when they know each other that well. Um, but it's possible, we, we, we may be about to have an alliance at any time. So the, uh, uh, the argument is that um, like the left is trying to find its, its distin distinctions um, to the left while not enough to the right. Yep. And and the left has got too much of a division with the Greens, and the left, I don't, I don't know anything about here, so I can't put my foot in it at all. In Britain, the Greens are seen as uh, well-meaning but rich, posh people. Um, so, if you kind of care about things in the world, but you're not, you've never been poor, then it's much easier to fight for the environment than it is to fight for social justice. So our division uh, is based upon class lines. Greens tend to be posher than, than Labour. But it's a, it's a stupid lack of working together. Um, 
the, the left and Greens are so good at arguing, whereas the right are well or generally, not at the moment, it's wonderful watching our Conservative Party tearing itself apart. You know, if you want a fantasy to dream about, it can happen. But the right in general are very good at coming together, lying, pretending they're all getting on, uh, and not telling the truth because they believe that most people are stupid. So why would you tell the truth to most people because you think they're stupid? Because a small number of people are clever and destined to rule in the interest of the stupid people they're going to rule over. That's the fundamental model of the right wing. Um, but the left in Europe has got itself into a doldrums or into a mess of not offering promise and hope at a time when it would not be that hard. We've never had fewer children. Never had fewer children. So why do we have 50% with no work in Spain? How, and we've never had a better educated young generation. So what a mess. We've never had more rooms per person in houses. But we managed to dispute our housing so that people can't get it. You know, a lot of these things are relatively easily solvable but we seem to have kind of run out of energy, imagination, uh, enthusiasm and optimism for the future. Now we have, um, um, of course, um, cities, um, let's, let's talk about maybe new municipality or um, uh, cities where the left or, the, or basically um, uh, governments or citizen uh, groups yeah. actually got into government to work exactly on these yeah. issues and give a lot of hope to people. And um, I... I think that there's a chance in cities, and I wanted to discuss with you because you mentioned that cities generally see this huge lack in, in difference, um, in, in inequality. Yeah? Um, now, if we see the city as the place actually to, uh, for things to change, well, if we experience yeah. this in different places, how does this relate to the to your theory, also the theory that is uh, out there to say, okay, especially in place like that societies are more resilient, the less inequality would there, uh, there would be. Mm. Um, how does this relate to cities when cities actually experiencing exactly, and uh, now we're not talking so much about Vienna maybe, yeah. but um, uh, more hardcore cities um, uh, where inequality is very high. Yeah, it's, it's hard, it appears to be hard to make that much difference if you're governing or running a particular city. Um, where in the, in, the, in the case I can tell you recently something has happened, uh, in where I come from is, is Scotland. So the Scottish government have made a, a very big difference. Um, and the, to give you an example of infant mortality, in England and Wales, in 2015 it began to rise, 3.5 babies, one of the highest rates in Europe, 3.5 dying per thousand, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, and now 3.9. Uh, within 10 years, we will have a higher rate of infant mortality in England and Wales than Romania has. And England and Wales will begin to have a rate like a state in the United States. Scotland, where the government have quietly done a lot of things because there aren't many babies, it's not that expensive. In Scotland, they've paid for more midwives around the time of birth. They're spending 180 million on child benefits to be just given to parents. They do the baby boxes, but there's a lot more, but people know that their government cares about them in Scotland. Uh, Scotland, for 50 years, you were more likely to die if you were born in Scotland than in England. Glasgow was one of the worst places to be born in Europe, outside of Eastern Europe. Um, going back to 2000, 10, Scotland had a rate of four, babies dying per thousand, much higher rate than England. It's now dropped to 3.2. Scotland is within 10 years on this one measure, the easiest measure to alter, within 10 years of becoming part of the Scandinavian block of countries on infant mortality. It'll be with Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. So two places, and that, and that is political belief change, and, and that is largely Glasgow and Edinburgh, it's two cities, but it's having that power of government, even when you're controlled by another government. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, yes, please. Hold on for a moment, that the, the microphone will come. Mm. Thank you. 
I think the problem is that uh, people in cities like Vienna uh, don't appreciate what they have because they just got used to it. And at the moment, they just want to defend it. Mm. And the right wing parties uh, explain them to whom to have to, they have to defend it and how they should do it. So it's kind of a vicious circle. Mm. And the left parties can't explain why they were so important and still are. Yeah. So this is kind of this. Circle. Yeah, uh, and it may have to be broken by children complaining about the climate and something completely different. Um. I, I really have a question. I just wanted to come back to this uh, Amsterdam London thing. Yeah. So you say that. The, there is a moment of peak, and after that, the, mm. it's not increasing anymore. Is this um, I mean, could it be that it makes also sense not only for, for our hope, but also just to say, you know, okay, I mean, mm. your way of winning is just almost. At the end, you, you, our way of winning is tomorrow. Mm. But I'm asking myself, is it, I mean, can, can we just come back to it? Do you really sit here and say the increasing of house, like of making money through houses is over? No, uh, no, London's, London's an extreme. So London, it was speculation that pushed it up to this really high level. What, what, my country needs is, is an annual wealth tax. Uh, so we need a taxation as a percentage of the house price every year. We need taxation of any housing which is empty. We need, and this is the, this is the policy of the Labour Party, uh, we need compulsory purchase at minimal compensation of unused housing so that we can get people off the streets and, and homeless. You need a lot of political action. However, and, and that is the policies, um, However, because of the overseas investors, because in China you're only allowed to buy two properties, so they come all the way from China and buy in London, because the Americans made the Swiss banks open up the bank accounts, so the money's come out of Switzerland to London, because every tin box dictator buys in London, we've actually managed to get... London is full of luxury flats that are empty in the middle. And the amazing thing is they're sitting there, they're built. Uh, so we but it's a speculative bubble. In general, things only get better when you work really hard to make them better. But London is currently at the position, or well, Amsterdam in the very distant past, but Tokyo in 1989. Prices within a year, two years in, in Tokyo, almost half because of a spe speculative bubble. Um, what is the house price in London based on? We have 3,000 bankers being paid more than a million euros a year but will they be paid this next year, right? It's, and one, one thing that the speculative bubble's burst on, based on is the idea that a government will never come into power who will be able to tax wealth. But the nearer we get to a government coming into power that can tax wealth, suddenly the property isn't worth that much. But there are problems of house price, right? In Helsinki, the houses are too much. In Stockholm, they're too much. So in the best countries of the world, they haven't managed to work out how to control housing prices. But th they need to be controlled. This is something that should be within our power to simply get down, make sensible, so that nobody ever thinks they're going to make any money out of housing. You've got to see it as a normal good again. But I think there's two different ways that are, or like many different ways that are, that are spread out here. One is to say, okay, well, the bubble will ultimately, or like it's maybe already over and it slows down, but it's still increasing. Like just to give an example of uh, Vienna, there's also, um, actually we would have a lot of funds to build social housing. We didn't have enough land. There's like the last years, uh, there wasn't, it, it was the case that not all the social housing was built simply to the fact uh, that there wasn't enough land that you could actually build these houses mm. on and to spend uh, the public funds to do um, uh, funded housing. And in fact, now you could say, okay, at one point, all the land will be sold and um, 
and the prices will kind of uh, get slower, um, the price acceleration will get slower, and uh, we, are, we hit the tipping point. Or you could intervene politically faster, and basically this is also what, uh, what happened. Uh, and, this, um, and now I could celebrate kind of uh, the Viennese government, um, which we should in this case, uh, to say, okay, in order to actually step, stop the sort of land grabbing, if you can call that so, in, in Vienna. But also, of course, Vienna is big on the, um, on the horizon for um, international um, access um, capital. Yeah? To actually say, okay, well, Vienna is a very good place at this moment to invest into. Like, it's land, uh, um, uh, beton gold in Vienna. Vienna is a very secure market, uh, and, and that's why it's super interesting here internationally at this moment. Um, and uh, so the government actually um, amended the building uh, code and uh, organized a new uh, zoning uh, regulation and zone. So from now on, if you have green land being zoned into housing, uh, it may be, and we all hope, and we will, we will politically fight for it, that then the zoning, um, uh, zoning will become funded housing, so social housing. And once it's zoned social housing, the land price is, in, with regard to another law, effectively limited. So what actually the government did was, um, and it was like landowners who were speculating on a high price, actually called it quasi-expropriation, mm -hmm. because um, they got expropriated of their expected um, gain, of their kind of speculation. So in fact, what it did at once was like stop the extreme explo explo um, exploiting um, uh, explo ex explosion yeah. of land prices. So why not kind of put into your scheme yes. yeah, that seems so automatically, yeah, kind of it's slowing down, what about bringing in kind of political actions? Mm. Or even test it to say how, to, how would it actually maybe go faster and that would not gen take generations for people to now hope that my grandchild will yeah. be better. Yeah, that it is often political actions. Um, my favorite book series is, um, my favorite time series is the number of books that were published each year since the printing press was generated. And in general, of course, the number of books goes up and up. But occasionally it goes down. And the reason it went down in the first few decades was because people burnt books. It was special political, so whenever you, you look at these curves and things, there is often a political action. Burning books wasn't nice, but if you want to stop people publishing more books, book publishers are very scared about publishing books in the year after somebody's just burnt a lot of them. Uh, political action really matters, but, you, but it's important to know that some things will, are on a trend to get better, so you can do action to make them even better. You're not facing a world in which everything's getting worse and you have to have action for absolutely everything. And if you don't, it'll go wrong. You know? But I think that's this hopeful thinking, of, yeah. uh, Leonard Hopeful, this, the, mm. to show that um, um, the world is getting better. That has been said, I mean, by yeah. the tripling down effect, the idea of like that uh, statistically everybody is getting, like statistically the richness is getting more. No, it, no, 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 it's, it's not necessarily that. Um, so trickle down doesn't work. There's more trickle up. Yeah. Yep. Um, but whatever is going on, very often the political actions are enough that are being done that they're having an effect in many cases. Um, but you're you're always left in a situation of thinking, this is bad. This is bad. We need to ch change that. We need to change that without realizing you know, each generation of children ends up being dramatically better educated than the generation before. It's not just that we're letting them go to school and university at 21. What they're being taught is better because they're being taught by people who are given more sense of freedom and to think. Uh, so when I went to school, I was taught by men who had been given the job of a teacher, not all, but in a large number of cases, men who were uh, came back from the war and they needed a job and they said, you can be a teacher. Completely untrained. And that was the standard British school in the 1970s. We then changed to have teachers had to be qualified, they have to have a degree. If you go to Finland, the nursery nurses have a master's degree who are looking after three and four-year-olds have a master's degree. The multiplying effect 
on the ability of another generation of this is, is very large. Now, people fought for that. Somebody said, we must respect this, we must train people more. But we don't tend to notice the multiplier effects of positive things. We just tend to think it's all going to get worse because that small group of people with the money are going to win. And you've got to stop them, but, but they're not necessarily winning as much as we think they and are. What's, what, what do you say when we say we need this driving force to, to fight for things? If we just believe in, uh, well, if we are hoping and believing in things are getting better, which is great, I think it's very good to kind of get us out here hope, hopeful. But isn't it the kind of driving force um, to, nope. to fight for things, yes. to be on the streets, nope. to keep it from deteriorating? Yes, but you have to know what to fight for. So one terrible thing that happens is that people still talk about there being too many babies in the world. And they say, we need to slow down the number of babies. It's terrible. Look how many babies they're going to have in Nigeria. Right? And it's just wrong and stupid. And all the effort put in to try and reduce populations, particularly in Africa, um, could be so much better uh, spent. What we have discovered is that one reason why the whole continent of Africa is destined to hit four billion people is that due to the IMF and the World Bank uh, withdrawing money from Africa in the 1980s and 1990s and making people pay back their loans, funding for schools was cut and particularly for schools for girls. So girls were made to leave school at 12, 13 or 14 and then they had more children. So the increase in the population of Africa is directly linked to the behavior of rich countries that lent the African countries money, but the population the slowdown is so fast in Europe and in China, but also heading that way for the whole of India, that it actually might be quite lucky that there's going to be an extra billion children in, in Africa, to, but we're incapable of seeing that. So we allow 5,000, 6,000 people to die trying to cross the Mediterranean. Well, not a single country in Europe is able to reproduce itself. You know, and it's that kind of thing, just explaining to people. There is no, we have all these cities. We have far fewer than two children each. Who is going to live in them? Are you, are you successful with this um, nearly biopolitical um, uh, <laughs> position in, in keeping people from, I don't know, from being uh, racist, uh, xenophobic or... Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm, I do lots of talks in schools. Mm -hmm. And in schools, people are still uh, deciding their opinions. Um, I think, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, have you decided everything in life? Um, and there were, there were big different attitudes about race by age. And the attempts to measure those, there's The, the biggest group who, in Britain who appear to be most racist at the moment are men of my age who were the same men who were in the National Front in the 1970s. So there's a cohort of bigots. Um, we don't see a new set of young people coming up with these attitudes, but, it's, it's a, but that's just in the country I live in. Um, but all we can do is measure in surveys. You can have your opinion from talking to people or reading newspapers, or you can measure how people behave in certain surveys, what they do, how many mix at work, how many mix when they marry, how many have children with each other. Uh, you asked um, for the question of like how much money we pay um, for university in Vienna. Yes. And uh, I believe it's now 300, 400 euros per semester. Hmm? then you have to pay only after a certain time, exactly. So um, the question is, um, it is exactly because people critiqued every single step, like students critiqued ev every single try of governments to raise that only by 100 euros, mm. so to say. And, um, and some people, like in London, would say, yeah. but don't worry, 100 is really not much, right? Mm. Or like um, compared to the, the large amount of money that we pay over there. Mm. And uh, so if, if we were to compare the situation here with the worst or with the kind of a bad mm. condition, then of course we would constantly give in. But if we were to compare it to, and to a certain utopia of mm. zero, yeah, 
paying zero for education, then basically you will not give, give in a single step like yes. for another euro. So um, uh, I would just want to see how criticality could still be exactly this, this, um, this mode of like um, criticality means basically also to, to value something, right? Yes. To celebrate it. Mm -hmm. And if we could find this argument of saying, okay, to be critical of every step into the other direction does not mean that we are not ready to celebrate that we pay zero. Mm. Maybe we could rhetorically work on it, um, how we could actually always frame kind of the celebration, but mm. to say not a single step, kind of uh, not a euro more, or not a single mm. more space for um, a yeah. racist attitude or so, would keep it exactly there where maybe utopia is to mm. other places, but where it's a, it's a standard that we maybe don't see anymore, but which is constantly been worked for you know, mm. and been critiqued for. And um, I just see how um, also when people actually um, come to Vienna and then bring kind of great ideas of like how, how housing could be done because it's just been a step better, it's been developed a step better, for instance, in Berlin where it's really bad. Mm -hmm. And then we discuss and they say like, you know, don't even come with these ideas, you know, they're making the situation in Vienna much worse mm. as we are. Yeah. Yeah? So um, I think what is really great about this talk mm. is also what we can see is that this extremely dependent on the on the context of um, mm. from where uh, and 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 from the research yeah. context uh, uh, right. of speaking to what extent uh, we actually to what extent some evaluation of getting better or worse is being um, articulated. Yeah. Yeah? Thank you. Well, I didn't want to stop this discussion now because actually he's from Oxford, so you could actually challenge him with uh, some sort of Oxford, de Oxford debate um, uh, um, <laughs> mm. energy. Um, anybody want a last um, energetic? Yes, there's one more last one. Well, not the last one. <laughs> so I, I just saw your very nice diagrams of, uh, of your next book and uh, all, all those... Uh, uh, curves, they, they not even look like uh, something you could describe with the dif differential equations, mm. it's pure chaos. Mm. So it, it's very complex. Yes. So, w w and, uh, so I think it's very hard to take, uh, to be smart, to, to, to give an interpretation, e even in a large book. Mm. So what do you think about that most of interpretation are uh, very simple yes. and basically doesn't matter how complicated this curve is you will always use ideology to interpret it so you will be extremely unhappy about this curve or you will say i'm gonna defend this curve until the death yes the brilliant, brilliant question uh turned on All that's, just, all that's being shown here on the one on marriage is a single series of numbers. How many people got married this year, next year, next year? The data is not actually complicated. But what people do who write about marriage may pick one number from one year, one from another, and say something's happening. All I've done, which is slightly different, and it may fail, because people have got more able, I've forgotten the name of the effect, but when they measure IQ, it goes up generation by generation. Is say, well, let's just show you the data, say something about it, but yes, it's messy. Um, so I think the exciting thing here is this change in the 90s, but that's me and my imagination and my bias. The data is real, that's, there's a bias in that I chose to draw a picture of marriage, I could have chosen other things. I think people are getting more nuanced. Um, a small number of people absolutely believe in certain things, and I may be one of them, but I'm, I'm never quite sure. But if you look at elections, often a quarter or a third of people don't even vote. Uh, they, they, they're not that so set on certain ideas that they vote. And a, and a very other large number of people I'm not sure what they're going to do. They're movable. And we tend to have a danger of thinking that other people are really like us. 
they're set on, you know. But people who come to talks on a Monday evening are not normal people. And people who, you know, we, we are odd. So that's one reason for hope. But it's also the increased nuance of young people. I have no, I've set an enormous amount of hope in next generations, in them listening to each other, partly because we've brought them up in a, in a better way where you don't, like you poor people are having to, you know, I'm, I'm aware my voice is echoing at you. And it's a little bit like being in a 1960s classroom where you all have to write down what the teacher says, right? But education has changed so that people talk to each other and change and changed their views. That the only, the only time that's ever exciting doing science is when you draw something and you think, oh, I've made a mistake because that's the, it's the opposite to what I believe. And then you go back and get the data and find you haven't made a mistake. <laughs> you were wrong. Yeah, that, I've drawn thousands and thousands of maps. The only time it's ever exciting is when the map shows me the opposite to my belief. And my immediate reaction is I've made a mistake with the data. And then I actually discover that what I believed was wrong. Then I immediately change my view. And I often forget that I believe the other thing. Um, but... Okay. Add something yeah. there um, in terms yeah. of ideology because I was wondering where the graph of divorce is. Ah, that would be like um, like marriage. The other yes. thing, divorce. And then I was wondering because I'm I'm just studying um, uh, women's um, problems finding housing um, when they are in precarious uh, biographical situations, yeah. and we experience. A, I could now try to mm. draw this, um, do a research, and maybe the graph of uh, divorce actually also slows down. Yeah literally, because actually there's divorce lawyers telling people, women not to get a divorce because they will not find a house by themselves easily yeah. with their kind of economic condition. So we're in a, this is a desperate situation, yeah? So I'm just wondering to what extent such a moment of like slowing down a graph yeah. and being highly precarious would actually, where this, where this notion would be seen in such a graph? Okay. It's I have looked at divorce, uh, particularly in America, uh, and the rates, but one of the reasons the rates slowed down there is it got so ridiculously high in that people were getting married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, and wanted their kind of, and there's an actual limit to how much you can get married and divorced. In, in, America is the divorce capital of the world. Um, it's, so divorce generally is slowing down because fewer people are getting married young and you can live together and decide whether you, whether you want to. The, we, we, <laughs> it's okay. No, no, I, I was, was going to... It's getting too it's detailed get, now. I just wanted to show this, uh, like yeah, yes. bring in these this, this disturbing examples that oh, yes. actually kind of fight the tendency, right? Or, or oh, there are. Well, the, the, I mean, the, the most disturbing one, one is, um, is the number of women who are being murdered because the most common person who murders a woman is, is her partner, almost always the man. Um, that's, so we, me we measured that for an idea of how bad, I mean, it's terrible to use the murder rate of women as a measure to try to work out, is your society getting the relationships between each other better? But if it's, if it's dropping, and then the action, or the immediate action in Britain is half our women's shelters have closed in the last few years because the government cut cuts, there's nowhere to go when you want to run away from the man. Um, but in general, that's the immediate bad thing, but in general, uh, the murder rate of women in the last 15 years has much more than halved because women now immediately walk out. The first time he hits you, you leave. Well, I think um, there's unfortunately many proofs that yeah. this is also not the case. Uh, yeah. And I think, but um, I think what it, what it brings us back to is um, uh, also the, the general topic of, of this uh, lecture series, which is like freedom, whose freedom? Mm. And uh, exactly the question of like, um, if there's an equality in freedom in terms of really choosing um, if to walk out. I mean, I will prosaically cut it here and really give you the freedom to walk out <laughs> in terms of literally um, closing it here, because we do have the chance to actually have uh, um, drinks in the bar and continue the debate in a more informal situation. And um, I'm, thank you, I'm very grateful that you even though the acoustics, I think, may be really um, challenging, that you um, joined us and also um, um, kind of uh, stayed with us uh, for this time. And thank you very much for the invitation.
of us both and for, for your talk and the, the and challenge and the, the allowance to challenge you this way. Okay, thank you. Thank you.